Hey everybody, welcome to our second installment of The Well. This is our bi-monthly um, community gathering series where we check in with local artists and activists and community members and talk about what's going on in the world of activism, politics, community engagement here in Rhode Island. We've got a great panel today and I'm excited to get right to it. We're gonna to try to keep the presentations to about 10 minutes each. Um, and then at the end of each presentation, there'll be a small call to action or a way that you can keep up with um, the issues that have been spoken about here at the event. So let's get right to it. Our first panelist on the well is um, Quetia Osario. And she is the founder of Our Journey, which is a, um, a perinatal community-led um, wellness center focused on eliminating health determinants for communities of color. And she's also the first facilitator of Chocolate Milk Cafe RI, which is a breastfeeding peer support group to help encourage and support and educate Black, African, and Afro-Caribbean families. So welcome to Q. Hi. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you for the rest of my panelists. So it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I will be speaking on uh, Black maternal health in the state of Rhode Island, uh, where we are in regards to the Rhode Island doula bill, um, that legislation, and some of the work that I've been doing here in the community. All right, so you have a PowerPoint presentation. I will bring that up. Thank you. Okay, so I'll be speaking on building safe perinatal communities, um, equitable maternal care, uh, healthcare in Rhode Island. Um, and we're talking about just being sick and tired of being sick and tired uh, when it comes to disparities and injustice and inequities in Black maternal health care. Next slide, please. So my name is Quetia Osario. Um, I go by Q. Most of you in the community know me. I'm a mother of five, a wife. I'm the oldest sister, uh, favorite granddaughter, graduate of Bryant University, and currently attending Philadelphia University, um, which is now currently known as Thomas Jefferson University, and University, and I'm an aspiring certified midwife. Um, I'm the owner of Mama Blue Diaper Service, founder of Our Journey, um, executive director of the Urban Perinatal Education Center, co-founder and co-lead of Emojimia Collective. Shout out to all my members on the call, um, which is a Black doula collective here in Rhode Island and urban farmer and operator of Quaintly Farm and Journey Farm. I'll see y'all in the spring. Next slide. So Rhode Island Black Maternal Health, um, it's been several years of tenacity fighting for equity and justice. Um, and we've been in the Black Maternal Health Movement now for several years. Um, starting out way back in 2015 when the community supported me um, to become a doula. I traveled to Brooklyn, New York. I uh, trained in ancient song doula services. In 2016, I opened up the first uh, Rhode Island-based chocolate milk cafe. We currently have now three sites here in Rhode Island and part of the National Chocolate Milk Cafe. Um, then in 2018, I um, hosted doula training with uh, Shafia Monroe Consulting. Um, 2019, did the maternal child health specialist training, which was a collaborative um, with Sister Fire, Lifespan Hospital, Women's Health Council. And we basically um, educated the community on what it meant to be maternal child health specialist, had a um, full day training. Um, that same year, uh, the Mojinia Collective was um, introduced, um, which was six dynamic women from the community who had taken these trainings and began their journey to be doers in the community to promote equity uh, within the perinatal space. Uh, 2021, um, I launched the Urban Perinatal Education Center, which we're currently fundraising to build a safe space for the Black and Brown community to come and receive perinatal care. And um, the next goals are to build a BIPOC midwifery cohort and eventually a birth center. Next slide. 
So we talk about maternal health, we're bringing it back to the beginning where black women were honored only because of their ability to build the workforce to create this nation. We're talking about being stock, chattel and property. Um, that is the history of our stolen women in this country for black women. And the way to take out the threat is to always take out the source. Black women have endured rape, separation, conditional brainwashing of our own children, forced to continue under the most disgusting practices allowed by constitution, by health and government and supported by slave owners, including white women. Her children were whip, ripped from her, sold into slavery, starved and forced due to wet nursing, murdered and hung. Our beautiful sons are seen as a threat and our sweet daughters are considered expendable. A disposable population and our suffering has been constant. Next slide. The Rhode Island Black maternal landscape. So Rhode Island Black maternal mortality is three to four times greater than our white counterparts. The Rhode Island infant mortality is three times greater than our white counterparts. And Rhode Island Black women wage disparity is 57 cents on the dollar. So we're dealing with not only an unjust um, landscape, we're also dealing with uh, economic disparities that don't even allow us to kind of move ahead, to move into spaces where we can create a dynamic home um, to provide disposable income to take care of our children in the way that we want to build health equity um, and, and, and economics within our community. And so we're fighting constantly. It's like you know, a snow, a snowball going up uphill battle, constant, constant with the wind coming down upon you. We talk about black weathering in our community and our bodies just being torn from political violence, from police brutality, from um, our communities being di divested and we're not getting any economic resources. We're currently under a housing crisis. We're under a financial crisis. We're under a pandemic and we've been experiencing black maternal epidemic now for several years. This is not new to Rhode Island. Next slide. Perinatal doula services. Um, this is an entrepreneur profession. It is not a hobby. And as an industry, we do not support volunteer or advertise for free work as a standard of practice for the doula profession. Families are seeking trained, qualified professionals who can assist them in the most vulnerable time of their lives, advocacy, education, and support. Being a perinatal doula is not about providing stand-in support for families or friends. It is not about the baby. No one is willing to sign up for a four-day hospital stay. We get this a lot with the Rhode Island doula bill of people thinking that, um, you know, we need to either be licensed or professionally supervised and regulated because there might be someone, you know, who's not a real doula. Um, the work we do is very hard. We are in constant training, constant professional development. We wanna give our best to our community. For me and my collective, I know for us, we are looking at the people that we serve as ourselves. And so we're always putting our best step forward. This doula legislation is about equity. It's about providing an equal standing um, and an initiative for our moral consciousness to support our working families, our new moms, um, and those people who are expecting and expanding their families. And so we want people to understand that these dual services are not just um, a whim. It's not just bottom-based support. We are intentional in our, in our work and want to provide the best resources for families, the best service, so that when you look back on your birth, you say, wow, that was such a wonderful experience. I'm so glad I had a doula. I'm so glad I had a great care team in the hospital. I'm so happy for my experience. And you look back on the birth of your child as joy. Next slide. So here are some of the requirements for perinatal doulas. This is just a quick guide. So when we, become, when we get trained, um, we also are businesses. So we have to get permits, license, registration. We pay taxes. We have general and professional insurance. We have a code of ethics, a scope of practice, and proper governance. We also are responsible to our community um, to engage with them, to provide them education, to provide them with support. So I don't want people to think like this doula bill is just a one-off. This is a dedicated commitment to the community for families and we want to continue to bring you along with us so that you feel empowered and you can advocate for yourself sometimes not everyone can afford a doula and that's what this bill is about it is saying to our communities to our employers to our state please stand with us support us so that we can receive the services that we need so that we have the best we have the best experience um, and as you know this campaign is also part of the right from the start campaign because we want to get this right right from the start next please We are not licensed professionals. So I say this because we are cert certified, evidence-based and approved, but we are not midwives. 
we work alongside midwives, midwives, family medicine, and obstetricians, Rhode Island's licensed professionals in the medical industrial complex institutions, a certified doula, a birth doula, a postpartum doula, bereavement loss doula, preconception, adoption, and abortion, all are underneath the Rhode Island certifying board. And that is what we're asking for, for you to support us so that we can continue to be part of your care team in and outside of the hospital. Next slide, please. The Rhode Island Reimbursement Doula Act, is the, known as the Rhode Island Doula Bill, is an equity initiative for childbearing rights. This bill is building towards our state priorities, equitable care beyond the hospital into the home, not mandated by government, but supported and prioritizing the needs of the family. I hope you will join us in this fight. Next slide. Please keep in touch. Here is some information in which you can continue to be involved. You can look on the Rhode Island uh, Doula website, www.ridoulabills.com because every family deserves a doula and every doula deserves to be paid. Thank you for your time. That was fantastic, thank you. Um, so again, you're gonna be hearing a lot of um, panelists from a wide range of uh, backgrounds and expertise and um, follow up with them. Um, learn about the doula bill, support the doula bill. Um, and you know, this is just another great way that you can um, keep in touch with what's going on here in Rhode Island. Um, so we're gonna move right along to our next set of presenters. So these are actually, we're moving into the art side of um, our panelists today. And so we have a pair of local filmmakers, um, Sarah Archambault and Margot Gernsny. Um, who are in the post-production phase of um, a film that they've just been working on about the um, 2020 election and the process behind it. So I'm gonna go ahead and show the trailer for their film, very exciting. And, um, and then we'll give the floor to them. So let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. This is the trailer for their film, What Democracy Looks Like. Hi, picking up for Providence, yep. Yeah. I'm picking up whole books. There's something about elections that you just grow to love and hate at the same time. <laughs> well, what do you mean there's two separate gyms? It's like managing a hundred weddings. I have worked in elections for almost my entire professional career. It's something that you get involved in it and you just want to do a good job. Do you have mass required signs at your polling places? These always want to be about six feet apart. So much is riding on this election. Everybody has a vision for what they want the country to be. And that's why we have elections. It's the voice of the people. Well, we're the catalysts that allow that voice to echo. It's been a difficult year because it's not just work, it's also your home life. The city of Providence has to close their office for a couple of days due to a positive COVID test. The way the political landscape is. Providence is gonna burn! There's such a lack of trust. It's going to be hard to undo. I want a physically home. I don't want her to touch. Okay, that's fine. That's your right. These are mail ballot applications that have come back from voters. I will vote at the polls. Eat shit. That's a good one. Not sure why people get so upset. But the reason why we do this is that people can have those opinions. They all think we have some kind of agenda. The only agenda we have is that you have the right to vote. Our staff cares. They care about every single voter registration they process, every single voter. This is the most important piece of equipment. Voting does not happen if this machine isn't working. This should all be on that side. We're overwhelmed. We're working very long hours. This is going to be wild. All right, we're in trouble. I don't know what the fuck is going on. They're freaking out because they're not sinking. It's not a crisis where you can't stop voting because people are still going to be able to vote. Cousin, what in the near? She just sent me a picture with her sticker. People are really touching me today. I don't think there's not one canvassing department that doesn't go home and have a meltdown. The pressure of this is monumental. 
we're just not processing them fast enough. We've got to figure out a way to make it work in the conditions that we're facing and still succeed in the end. Because we can't fail. We have no choice. Elections cannot fail. We can't fail the voters. Fantastic. That gives me chills watching that. <laughs> Great job. So I give the floor to uh, Margo and Sarah to talk about their film. Thank you. Um, thank you for having us and thank you to the rest of the panelists. This is the first time we've actually played that trailer publicly and it gave me chills also to watch it knowing that there's an audience. So thank you for being a part of our, our first day, de our debut. Um, this is a film, as you can tell, uh, it's about the workers who make the election happen. We followed behind the scenes in Rhode Island um, at all of the different levels where elections administration happens. So that's the Secretary of State, State's office, the Board of Elections, and a variety of local canvassing offices around the state. And the idea is that we will be um, making a feature length documentary with this footage. Hi. Um my name's Sarah. Um, thank you, Margo, for like setting us up here. Um, and, you know, many folks ask us, how did we get access to uh, this process? How is it that um, we were able to even just enter into this space? And, you know, the story about Rhode Island is frequently often that you got to know somebody. <laughs> and, um, you know, sometimes that has a really negative context and that, and that should be, um, you know, that's an honest and, and well-founded critique. But I think the other thing that's really quite wonderful is that in Rhode Island, you're also only like maybe two beats away from being able to make real change if you put your mind to it. So um, I was fortunate to have um, a friend who worked in elections who opened some doors and then the next person opened doors. And then I would say that Margot and I had to go into these spaces and really earn the trust of the folks that we, um, that we were observing for over the course of about five months. Um, but why did we make this movie, Margot? You take that one. <laughs> So um, I think everyone watching probably um, has a pretty deep of an understanding of what we were up against uh, going into this election. And we knew just like all of you did that we, that there was going to be, that, that we wanted a, fear, a free and fair election and that there were a lot of people working for that and, and weren't quite sure what the outcome would be. And what's in the media a lot of the time or almost all of the time is the candidates and their detractors and the political pundits, but a, they're a huge piece of democracy is the actual people who do the work. And this is true, you know, I would say across, our, we have this problem in almost every space in our society where the people who are doing the work are not asked their opinion about how things should go, are not recognized. And so we essentially are working, making this film to, to to have to for those people to be seen and recognized and acknowledged um so and 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 one thing that i think a lot of folks don't know is that the people who make the elections happen even with all of the new technology um the poll books you all use when you went into a, to vote the the wi-fi system that sends the vote counts and all of the potential issues about cybersecurity that are related even with the technology it's real humans who are making it work. It's real humans who are fixing the tech when it's broken. It's real humans who are double and triple checking the numbers, counting paper ballots and making sure the number of paper ballots matches the number on the computer. So it's human driven. It's a human driven system. It's just humans who use the technology and they're your neighbors. <laughs> there are people from our communities. I think I just want to add to that, that of course the right to vote is sacred for all of us, but we may have seen in the last election uh, cycle how the work of election administrators was deeply questioned. They were attacked. They were assailed. There was death threats um, from folks who were just technicians in, um, you know, back rooms up to secretaries of state. And I think one of the things, or one of the most important things that Margot and I observed, is, you know, we didn't, we don't just know this. We saw it, is that these election administrators take that sacred right with a deep seriousness 
and a vigilance that um, we're excited to just share with the public um, for you all to see that for yourselves. I hope it's something that you know in your hearts, but it was something that we were really excited about. And, um, you know, we, we take, we have a, a real pride in this team that we have here in Rhode Island. I think, you know, just married to that too, is this idea that um, civil service work is actually valuable and noble work. And, you know, in many ways, the um, civil service work has been, you know, you know, people kind of think, oh, well, that's just a cushy union job or it's paper, paper pushing bureaucracy. And there are, you know, many of those critiques may, may hold water. But I guess what I would say is what we also saw was that these, I've rarely seen people work harder. Um, they carry a, a real burden with them in this work and it is deeply meaningful work to them. And I think that um, we should all find a way to recognize that work. You know, in many ways, we all know that this was one of the, um, you know, this election was the largest turnout we've ever had. Um, imagine the largest turnout you've ever had at your job and how that would overwhelm you. Uh, you know, we, we were able to bear witness to some of that and we saw some real extraordinary work from these folks. Um, just to give you a sense of the filmmaking process, because, you know, some folks see the trailer and they're like, I want to see the movie. <laughs> um, so we shot the film in 2020. We were shooting from about July to December with a couple of little shoots in January. Um, we will be editing the film throughout this year. So 2021 is kind of putting the story together. And then our hope is to, uh, and our plan is to release the film, premiere it and release it in 2022. So we'd like to premiere it in early 2022 and have it released as, um, you know, a narrative and tool to use up to the midterms, uh, you know, running up to the midterms. So that's our whole goal with the film. Um, I think that you know, we have some action items for you. There's, there's small ones. I don't know, Margo, do you wanna give the first couple? Sure, um, we're putting together a mailing list and we'd love to have you join us on this journey. And the point of this film really is to be a tool in the work of democracy in 2022. And so I think they're gonna drop a link in the chat and it'll also come out in a newsletter. So if you wanna join our mailing list, please also spread the word. Um, and there's a donate link if you feel moved to donate to the project, uh, we're independent filmmakers so every penny counts um and then i think sarah's going to talk about some um action items in the meantime oh yeah well i mean for those of you who are just really interested in what's happening um with uh elections in rhode island right now there is a bill um that's being pursued an initiative being pursued by common cause the women project and their coalition called um let our i vote and you can go to let our i vote.org one of the things that I think um, everyone in the election system learned this year, particularly in Rhode Island, is that, you know, with the result of turnout being so high, Rhode, Island's, Rhode Islanders loved having options. They, ex you know, almost exactly one third of the state participated with mail ballots, one third of the state participated um, in early voting or emergency voting, that's early voting. Uh, and a third of the state came on election day. And what that tells us is that Rhode Islanders want options. They want, to under, they want all the different ways to access the ballot that they can. And this initiative is looking to secure that expanded access. So if you're interested in learning more, um, let rivote.org is the place to look. And that's it for us, I think. Great, thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, as you mentioned, the Woman Project is part of the coalition that is um, behind the voting bill. So definitely follow that. You can follow us on our social media as well to stay updated on um, those bills. So that's great. Thank you so much. Um, coming up, moving right along, we have our next panelist who is Rachel Flume. And she is the executive director of the Economic Progress Institute. And she's gonna talk about uh, some of the campaigns that they have going on. She also has a PowerPoint presentation. Um, Rachel, did you wanna speak before I bring up the PowerPoint or do you just wanna bring it up? No, you can bring it up and I'll, I'll speak as you're doing that. So Great. 
Thank you, Tammy, and for the Women's Project for having me on today. Um, I, I'm mostly excited to hear about all of my other panelists. I told my kids that I'm by far the least cool person on this panel today, <laughs> so I appreciate you letting me be in your company and learn about all the work that you're doing. Um, but we are the Economic <laughs> Progress Institute, and we are a research and advocacy organization here in Rhode Island. We've been around for about 20 years, and our mission is to improve the economic security for Rhode Islanders living with low and moderate incomes. So what does that mean? Um, so we have a certain number of key issue areas that we work on. Um, we work on state taxes and budgets. We look at poverty, wages, and income. We think about a lot about public uh, programs and benefits and how they can support folks when wages and uh, income is not enough. And then we look at some um, key specific areas like workforce development, so help get people um, or ensure that there are programs that can help people get the education and training they need to have uh, family sustaining jobs. So we do that in a number of ways. We're, we're um, unlike Q, who was on before, who's speaking from a place of real passion from, because she's doing this work, we are really coming at this work, trying to show the data piece of this. Um, so we're taking stories uh, from the ground or taking stories that we hear how systems are not working. And we do research to try to provide um, the data element. So when we're in a legislative hearing, people can't say, well, you know, how many people does that impact? Nobody has any idea. Maybe we don't really need to do anything about that, right? So we're trying to provide the, the data sources. Um, so we do research. We also have a very active legislative campaign that I'm going to talk to you about. We do tracking of legislation um, to try to keep a handle on both the good bills that we can uh, provide support for and also the bad um, bills that we need to, to provide some data about why they are bad policy. Um, and then we do public uh, education and training. So tonight I wanted to talk about um, a piece of uh, our research that we've done and we do every couple years called the Rhode Island Standard of Need. And you can turn to the next slide. And what this does is looks to explain what the cost of living here in Rhode Island really is. Um, so a lot of people think about, you know, what is the poverty level? Who is living in poverty? But the truth is that many more people are struggling to meet their basic needs than just the folks who are earning poverty level wages or below. So you can go to the next slide. So we look at what is a very conservative budget for three different income groups. So a single parent, a single, uh, a single parent with two children, uh, a toddler and a school-aged child, uh, a two-person family with, again, a toddler and a school-aged child, and then a single adult. And we, we think this is a very conservative budget. We don't look at internet costs. We're not looking at clothing allowances or birthday celebrations or having pets. Uh, we're really assuming that folks are living um, just meeting their basic needs and what the costs are that they have to, to do that. Um, and so what we found is that in today's society, you know, unlike in the 1950s, which is when the federal poverty level was created, then at that time, it was thought that food took, took up about a third of a family's budget. Now we know that childcare takes up a thir full third of a family's budget, housing takes up a good quarter, um, and then healthcare is also a big chunk of that. Um, so today's you know, families look very different than, than they did in terms of need. Um, and so, uh, so the next slide will show you know, what our findings are. So our expenses for a single parent with two kids is about $57,000 a year um, here in the state of Rhode Island. That means that a person needs to be earning $66,000 a year when you account for all the taxes and the tax credits. For a two parent family, they need to be earning $73,000. And for a single adult, they need to be earning 30,000. Coincidentally, that is about 14, 60 an hour which is um, just under the $15 hour minimum wage that folks are fighting for, and that's for the single adult. So it, we know that a quarter of folks who are earning minimum wage are those single parents with kids. Um, and so th th to think about the minimum wage and how far behind it is what folks actually need to make ends meet um, is really pretty criminal at this point. Uh, next slide. So this is our slide that just shows 
how far below the federal poverty level um, people actually, I mean, how far behind the federal poverty level is in terms of measuring economic security. So our single parent, the federal poverty level is $21,000, but that single parent needs to be Earn, has expenses of 57,000 and needs to be earning 66,000. Um, so well over twice the federal poverty levels just to make ends meet. Next slide. And unfortunately, we know that way too many of our black and Latinx households are not earning nearly enough um, to make those ends meet. Um, if you look at the single adults, 59% of black single adults are not earning that uh, $30,000 that they need to make to just meet their basic expenses. And if you look at the single parent family, 91% of Latinx single parent families, 91% are not making that $66,000 to meet their family's needs. This is really a crisis that we need everybody to pay paying attention to. Um, and we hope that the, the data like this can make this point um, because we're hearing a lot about essential workers and we're hearing a lot about how people aren't meeting their basic needs. And we hope that this kind of data can, can drive those points home. Next slide. So what can you do? Um, so we have a lot of campaigns that we work on, but I was just gonna talk about three tonight. Um, you know, We think it's really important to think about how we can both work on lifting incomes. So thinking about increasing the minimum wage, talking about fair pay legislation and thinking about you know, essential worker supports, but also at the same time, thinking about how government programs can support these families and individuals until their earnings catch up so that their family sustaining earnings. Um, so I just wanted to hit on three of our campaigns today and we encourage you to go to our website to see all of the campaigns that we're working on. Um, but next slide. So this first campaign is our Raising RI um, campaign. Raising, uh, Rhode Island Works is our state's welfare program. Um, it is called Rhode Island Works, um, which was from the Kachiri administration. He really wanted to make sure that everyone was working in order to be able to get any benefits. That's an, a story for another day. But the crime of the program now is that there are only about 2,600 families who are, or 2,500 families who are still um, able to get the benefit of um, $554 for a mom and two kids. That's $554 a month for a mom with two kids. Now, looking at our chart that we showed earlier about how much a mom with two kids needs to make to meet basic needs, we're talking half of the poverty level is what these families are bringing in, even if you are accounting for SNAP and food stamps and other benefits. This benefit here in Rhode Island has not been raised in 30 years since I was in middle school. <laughs> you know, this, that's criminal, right? And all of the other New England states have, have higher um, eligibility, have higher um, benefit amounts and have raised them since ours has been raised. This actually does not take any state dollars. We have federal funding that comes in. And so it's really just a matter of the state deciding that they wanna support these families. So we encourage you to go to raisingri.org. You can sign on to support the campaign and you'll get more information. There are hearings in both the House and the Senate on this. Um, the governor's budget that was introduced um, deals with some other supports for these families, but not this piece. Um, and so we really need everyone to raise their voice and tell their legislators why this is important. Next slide. Now, this campaign, the Right from the Start campaign, Q mentioned briefly in her presentation about doulas. This is a campaign of different organizations and individuals who's really focused on the beginning of life. So for children, birth through age eight. Um, and so it's a host of legislative issues, including childcare assistance, which as you saw from my earlier slide is a huge piece of families' budgets. And it also is something where the workers who are providing the, the much needed childcare so that families can go to work are not make, making their own family budgets, right? They're low paid workers. Um, and so the system really needs a lot of support. We also, in this campaign, are working on the doula legislation um, that Q talked about at the beginning of the program, and we're working on paid family leave. 
Um, is Rhode Island is actually a leader in paid family leave in that we allow people to take time off that's paid and um, is job supported, which means if you take time off, you can't lose your job while you're out caring for a new child or for a seriously ill family member. So we're a leader in that. And we saw in the pandemic how important that was in supporting folks, but there's a lot of room for improvement. And so we're working on it, improving it. So, uh, and then there's some other, other pieces involved in that. So I encourage you to go to this campaign and if that's your area of interest, if you're interested in thinking about how to support families and children at the very beginning of life. Next slide. And last but not least, this is our uh, campaign that often people like to yell at me for, you know, so on the, we believe in making sure that families can meet their basic needs, but we think also that we should be involved in talking about making sure that our state budget um, has sufficient revenues to fund the goods and services, both for the programs who need extra support, but also so all of us are, are uh, driving on roads that are not don't have a lot of potholes who are able to attend beaches that are beautiful and well maintained um, and all the other goods and services that the government supports. Our, our tax code right now is upside down, meaning that the lowest income folks are paying when you account for all taxes between 10 and 14% of their income in, in taxes. But our top 1% of, or folks that are earning over $475,000 are only paying about 8% of their, uh, their income in taxes. We think this is fundamentally unfair. We think those folks at the top can afford to pay more. And we know that our state needs extra resources in order to make it the best state it can be. So we encourage you to go to revenueforri.org and um, get involved with that campaign as well. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for educating us on the campaigns that can be um, followed up on. There's a lot going on in the legislature right now. And uh, we just encourage people to stay informed and get involved. And again, we're gonna be um, posting these links in the comment section and we're gonna be sending them out on our mailing list. So um, if you're not on the Women Project uh, mailing list, sign up for that so you can get all this follow-up information. So coming up next, moving right along. Um, no favoritism here at all, but this uh, next um, panelist is a member of our Woman Project family. She's a board member of the Woman Project and um, a dear friend, of course. And um, she's also the founder of Step Forward Strategies and uh, Can I Walk? And she's gonna talk about all of the great things that she's involved in right now. Please welcome, this is Stephanie Olarte. Hey everyone, how are you? Thanks, Tammy. Um, there's a little favoritism, it's a little. <laughs> um, uh, I just wanna start though uh, a little bit before I go into depth of my stuff. Um, on Tuesday, there was a, I guess a terrorism attack is how I see it uh, in Atlanta, um, where eight people died um, or were killed actually. And I wanna take a moment to have um, the AAPI community, um, you know, I, I want us to, think about them and to make sure we can help in any way we can. Um, because I am a board member of the Women's Project and we've been talking about this a lot, um, it is really important for us to, um, you know, be inclusive and, and discuss issues like this. And I thought this opportunity was important as Step Forward Strategies. I, am, I do have a fundraiser going on that's specifically for the AAPI community. And if anybody wants to go, we will be linking that in the um, in the chat be below, so you guys can check it out. Um, and if you want to fund, uh, give us some money for the AAPI group in Atlanta, that would be great. So um, I am, like she said, the founder of Canine Walk is Step Forward Strategies. Canine Walk is an organization that I created for um, youth with disabilities. We wanted to make um, 
or give opportunities to people with disabilities starting at a young age. Um, for me, it was a little harder. I didn't really have organizations that catered to myself when I was um, in school. I did have one organization that I gravitated to that helped me um, realize my dream of going to college. And I was able to do that, which was um, at the time called the Children's Crusade. Now it's the uh, Rhode Island College Crusade. Um, and I, you know, I took that opportunity and went with it. But a lot of students with disabilities didn't have that. And so for me, it was really important to create an organization that would cater to the disability community, particularly when they were young. Um, so that's what Canine Walk does. We wanna make sure to bring people um, resources and um, help them understand their value and how important they are to the community and what they can actually give the community as soon as they, you know, leave high school and enter um, college, if that's what they want, or the workforce. Um, then I decided to do step for strategies because your girl needed money and I really like working on, <laughs> on um, diversity and inclusion. So I said, why not bring out my own consultant firm that works on these very issues uh, that have to do with communities of color, uh, marginalized communities, and bringing that into one space um, in areas that are in the corporate world, um, that are in organizations, nonprofits, and of course, um, you know, politics, because that's really where my specialty is, politics and policy, and getting people to run for office. Um, from Step for Strategies, I really brought it um, with It's Her Time, where we were able to bring um, this pack together with a group of amazing people here in Pawtucket, and we were able to change our city councils, um, you know, in general, we, they were all men, <laughs> but we had two women, one white, one woman of color, and everybody else was white men. So now it's a little more diverse. Um, it has um, women from Black, uh, Latinas, um, you know, Cape Verdean women, everything. Uh, white men, older white men still there, but, you know, we'll eventually get them out. Um, so, <laughs> so a little bit of that is what I love doing with Step Forward Strategies. I love, love, love working um, with the Women's Project because we are doing a lot of things that benefit women, but also benefit men in the long heart because it all has to do with families and it has to do with how we build a better community here. And with that, I want to talk about our great policy that I'm sure Tammy has you know, heard us talk about a lot. Um, uh, so the Equality and Abortion Coverage Act um, is what we've decided to put again uh, in 2021. Um, it is really important bill for women. Um, it has to do with abortion coverage. You know, we, we had a huge, huge campaign two years ago, two years ago, and we were working hard to pass the RPA. We went through a lot of turbulent moments in that state house, <laughs> long hours in that state house. Um, we, we made a lot of noise. We create, we made trouble. We got ourselves in pickles here and there, but at the end of the day, we definitely were able to to smile some of us cried because eventually the rpa passed and it is great that we were able to codify um roe v wade here in the state but what good is it if we can't access it for women if women can't actually pay for for their abortion um so the next step was that how are we going to find a way to make that accessible. So this, this bill um, is one of the reasons we, we jumped on it because we wanted to make sure that the ban that withholds health insurance coverage for abortion in the state Medicaid program um, is, you know, is, is removed. Um, it's kind of like our own little version of the Hyde Amendment, so to speak. Um, denial of coverage for abortion in the state employees is a thing here in Rhode Island. And that is something that we want to um, 
change. We want to make sure that we can have every woman, whether in the state or not, to, to be able to um, feel that their insurance will be able to cover it. Um, I wanted to share my screen real quick. I don't know if you can give me access to that. Um, so I wanna show you guys the bill in our website. Um, so if you have the ability to do that, Tammy, let me know. Um, I just made you a co-host, so I think you should be able to do it now. Okay, let me check. Um, yes. Uh, so our website right here, pretty website, will give everyone a little bit of information on, whoops, on the bill itself, who covers it. The information that we're trying to bring about here is um, pretty much all there. I want to give a shout out to our Senate sponsor, uh, Senator Verde and Rep Kassar, um, who really took upon themselves to bring this, you know, this bill to, to the state and we're ready to fight for it. So I, I wanna thank them for that. Um, and I wanna thank the people that have um, really, really been at the side of, of us, of women. I do wanna say that right now we are in a situation where the bill is supposed to be in the Health and Human Services Committee but unfortunately, it is not. It was put in the Judicial Judiciary Committee, and I feel that we're going to, I feel no, this is not the right place where it should be, and I think we need to um, put some pressure on, on the committees <laughs> so that it can be moved. Um, you know, there are a few people that are there that supposedly are for um, women's rights for reproductive health. Senator Yor is one of them that I, I believe she um, voted for it to stay in the Judiciary Committee. And I think we need to talk to her along as um, Senator Coyne um, and a few others that didn't want it to get out of there. We can, we have the opportunity to have it move we can still have the opportunity to get it moved. It's still time. There's still a way to convince people. And I guess my my point here for this particular bill is that we will have a postcard um, campaign again. And we need all the support in the world. Um, we need you guys to come to our website, volunteer, um, donate, and let us uh give you some postcards <laughs> so that we can get these postcards to the people uh letting them know that we really really do need this bill to get out of judiciary into human services to health human services and um have this pass because if not it's just going to be a wash and um this year would probably not move this bill at all and we could have it moved if we if we work hard enough like we did in 2020 as a collective to make this go to the other direction. Um, uh, at this point, that is my biggest ask. <laughs> Volunteer for the Women's Project, get in contact with us because we have a lot going on. We have a lot of, of work that we, we are planning to do um, and particularly this policy, this bill, um, is one of them, and and it's the top of our priorities. And in order for us to get this bill anywhere um, to pass, we need volunteers and we need uh, postcards, um, writing and mailing, and we need people to call, help us call. Um, it's very important to call your senators, your representatives, um, and and just say you know that you are with this bill and that you want to see it move to the Health and Human Services Committee instead of where it is right now in the judiciary. Um, if you have any, if anybody needs any information in terms of who to contact, if you want to go directly to, to the leadership, we can give you that information, but it's also readily available in, in the 
in the state house <laughs> representatives page, um, which we can link also. Um, but we we do really need people support, um, and the best way to do it is postcards right now. Keep an eye for projections. Keep an eye for all the things that we are going to be posting in our Facebook page, in our website, in our newsletters. Um, so yeah, I think that's the big one for me. Like, please, please, please help us move um, this bill out of judiciary and into the human uh, the health and human services committee. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. As everybody knows that watches this Women project, um, we are part of many coalitions, um, yeah. and um, but this bill is uh, our primary legislative focus as part of the Woman Project and our uh, legislative campaigns. So, um, if you want to yeah. stay um, up to date on what's going on and get involved, um, definitely go to our website, sign up for our mailing list. Uh, thank you so much, Steph. Yeah. And finally, last but most certainly not, not least, least. <laughs> um, we have a someone who is an artist, dancer, choreographer, activist, college professor. Um, he, uh, we're really excited um, to bring him to you today, and his name is Sokio Rose. So welcome, Sokio. The floor is yours. <clears throat> I came here as a refugee. In 1986, we moved to Rhode Island. Welcome to Hanover Street. There's boarded up houses, cracks in the pavement, broken glass on the floor. On one end of the street, there was this plastic factory. And all you can smell was melted plastic throughout the whole street. Around the corner, chickens feed in the vacant lot. On the other end of the street, we used to call this back then a prostitution house. Across the street from there, there was this liquor store and there were always people outside. And this, this is my house near the plastic factory. Gang members lived on the first floor, but they didn't bother us. They worked at a dye factory with my father and he drove them to work every single day. But during the summertime, they would just sit and chill on the porch and it would be hard for me to get in and out of the house. And as I'm coming by, they would just do one of these. And I wanted to go up and down. So what I did was, <clears throat> what are you, the king around here? You know, there was this nice green lemonade truck that went up and down the street, ringing its bell. Ring -a -ling -a -ling. Ring -a -ling -a -ling. They sold lemonade, chips, hot dog, soda, and drugs. There were bullet holes in my house. And my house was a target because it was a gang household. They would shoot there, they would shoot there, and they would shoot there. I never got hit with a bullet. There was this car. They drove it right into my porch, set it on fire, and blew it up. There was this one kid walking down my street wearing a red shirt. I watched him get beat up. I never wore red until I moved out of that neighborhood. Welcome to Hanover Street. I lived there for 11 years. I was six years old. I went to the, a school and it was the same way. Fast forward a little bit. I started getting to higher ed, uh, sorry, higher education. I didn't really feel right. Now I'm in high school. I went to classical high school. I don't know how I got in. I messed up in the test so many times. I didn't hear my name being called. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go to another school. Until my friends came up to me and said, yo, so you made it in. All right. It was such a culture shock for me. It was completely different and not what I'm used to. Completely out of my comfort zone. At the age of 15, I started break dancing with the gang members. Most of them taught me. And then we taught ourselves. We would dance on the street. We would dance in basements. We would dance in living rooms. We would have to take our shoes off though, because being Cambodian, you cannot have shoes in the house. Leave your shoes at the door. 
At the age of 16, I went to this place called Everett Company Stage and School. Back then, we called it the Carriage House. And I went for the first time. And there were people everywhere from my kinds of neighborhoods. Man, they were nice. Phenomenal, even. Yeah, one section they were breaking. One section they were, they were working on their poverty and locking. One section they were doing choreography. And I just got to my own little section and started dancing with some folks. It was my first time there. As soon as I was leaving, the director, Dorothy Jungles, comes up to me and she says, hey, you want to do an anti-tobacco educational school show? At that time, that did not sound attractive to me. Didn't want to do it. Took a little convincing. You know, you get paid 15 to 20 bucks per show. You get pizza or McDonald's after the final performance. And I still wasn't convinced. Then she said, you know, most of the school shows are during school. All right, sign me up. Because for me, that meant skipping classes. So I did it anyway. It never knew that this hobby flourished into a career. At the age of 18, 19, Everett Company Stage in School asked me to join, to join the professional touring company. Now this is a national touring company and all of their shows focus on social injustices. Anything from labor and union work to the arts, to um, racism, to social inequities in, within communities. And everywhere we went, I got a chance to connect with the community that we were working with, we were working at. And that was when I fell in love with community on stage. Every time I'm on stage, I'm having this conversation with them. And it was just beautiful to see, to, see, to witness, and to hear. And that's how I became an artist. So my name is Sokeel Ross. I'm an artist, educator, activist, refugee. I'm a Cambodian. I am professor, um, adjunct professor at Prov Providence College in trauma-informed education for an urban uh, teaching master's in education course. I'm also a professor at College Unbound. I am an artist at uh, Everett Company Stage and School still. I have a company called Case Close that I started in 2004 to have the youth, not to them power because they're already powerful, but to really branch out and do the moves that they want to do in a hip hop, dance and theater and bring that to New England. So give them a chance to voice their opinions, voice their, their voice really, and their bodies, all right? Um, but it wasn't easy because all of the traumas that I endured as I was younger and that was past time from the war affected me that I didn't even know about. And it was not easy. I remember one time that I was young, we were in public assistance at the time, fourth grade. And we're in line, we're waiting, we're waiting to get to the ice cream. And there were five kids in front of me. And in my pocket, my right pocket, I had a booklet of food stamps. Now, if you know what food stamps are, they're like the EBT cards, but the coupon version. So you get a booklet and you can, everyone has a value, right? So I'm sitting there thinking nothing of it. Kid goes by, kid goes by, and I'm getting anxious because there's only one ice cream sandwich left. And I love ice cream sandwiches. So as soon as I got there, there was that same ice cream sandwich. And I told the lady, I'll take that one, 50 cents. I got you. Took the booklet out, ripped out a dollar from the coupon, gave it to her. She pushed it back to me and said, we don't take food stamps. The kids behind me started laughing. I was completely ashamed and embarrassed of my position in life at that time. For one, I didn't get the ice cream. Two, I didn't have the two quarters to give to her. I had a dollar, but it wasn't the right dollar that they wanted. I went back to my seat and sat down. From that moment, on the way into my, until I'm in my early 20s, I was ashamed to use food stamps or an EBT card. Even if my parents used it, I would walk away or I would do it secretly and give to the cashier. How traumatic that was for a young kid at that time, living in a marginalized community, right? Looking at it from a perspective, I thought the United States was everything like, I thought the whole United States was like this. I thought all of America had this kind of neighborhood. This was normal to me. So when classical came by, complete culture shock. 
That's why when I went on tour, I gravitated towards places like the Bronx. I gravitated towards these communities that are, for me, rich in culture, rich in people, rich in traditions. But I didn't see the beauty of all that until I left Hanover Street and finding a beauty and the history and the cracks in the pavement and the trees with no leaves. But all the mental health that I was going through, I didn't really understand because of that stigma of not talking about it. And then I was labeled by society as that at-risk youth, the troubled child. And it traveled with me throughout my years as a youth. And I didn't completely understand it. I just always thought like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, whatever it is, that's who I am. It is not. I never got a chance to tell my story. And this is why I do the work that I do. I believe in the arts. I believe in mental health. I believe in healing. And I believe in the intersectionality of all three, three things. And the storytelling is so powerful that we have to know it's my story. I tell it, not society. It's your story. You tell it and you make sure it's known. And I don't believe in the rhetoric, the rhetoric of if I can do it, you can do it too. Everybody's lived experiences and circumstances are different. So with that said, it took a lot to get to where I'm at. And it's not because of resilience. This wasn't a choice. We didn't choose to be poor. We didn't choose to be in the neighborhood that we were displaced in. But that was what life was. You either break a fold or you keep moving forward. Luckily, the arts that I stumbled to as a hobby became my savior. If it wasn't for the arts, hip hop and dance, I'd be dead or in jail, period. So support your local nonprofits, your private student unions, your Everett Company Stage and Schools, your new urban arts, AS220s, Man Projects, the Wilbury Theatre, all of them, support them. They are life saving. And I am one of those kids that are still thankful to be here today. So I appreciate y'all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sokio. That was wonderful to listen to. I feel like our stories are very similar. I grew up in, in the hood, went to classical, saved by the arts. Like I totally know, and I totally used to use that food stamp coupon book and it was super embarrassing. So <laughs> thank you for talking about that. It was great to hear. And um, that's it. That's all we have for tonight. We had a slate of really wonderful panelists and I hope you enjoyed listening. I hope you feel inspired and galvanized to support your arts organizations, to support your local filmmakers, and to follow some of these legislative campaigns. Um, again, we're going to be posting links and we're going to be sending them out in our newsletter. So definitely, if you're not part of the Women Project newsletter, go ahead and sign up for that as well. And um, I want to thank all of our panelists. I want to thank Emily Boucher. She popped in. She was been with us the whole time. She's been helping with our uh, technical support and monitoring the stream. So thank you. And um, that's all for this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Tune in. Um, we Woman Project has things going on all the time, but the next installment of The Well will be in May. This is a bi-monthly uh, community gathering series. So Look out for us in May for the next installment of The Well. Thank you, everybody. Good night.